Thank you, Sandy, for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. I think it's, it's an honor for us to be here. We are both for the first time in Australia, so it's quite exciting. And as uh, Sunny said before, we are a collective of eight trained architects. This is uh, when we had an exhibition in, in Austria, where we uh, developed a separate entrance for our exhibition, which was open to all public for free, whereas the main entrance was where we had to pay. And um, we established almost uh, 15 years ago, but I think the main uh, experience for our practice was that most of us already met during uh, school in the early or late early 90s in Berlin. And I think the, the experience of the post wall Berlin with all these open spaces and things you could do was really uh, had a great influence on our work. And uh, the main issue of our work is uh, well the urban, which is uh, mainly the, the public space, what, what, what we are thinking about. And um, here you can see uh, it's a drawing which hides a lot of our projects in this urban scape. And for tonight, uh, we thought it could be interesting not only showing the best of farmable projects, but to tell something about Berlin. And that's why we decided to show only Berlin projects. And I think it's kind of interesting because um, one of uh, our very, very first project started off in Berlin, and uh, actually this was the project when Raumlabo Berlin was born, because we had to name ourselves for, for this project. And this, uh, it was, uh, actually, actually well, it was an open call for, for uh, some spots along uh, the subway line. We did decide for a spot called Moritzplatz, where is the point, which is kind of funny roundabout. And um, which is in between Kreuzberg, what you can see here with the Wilhelminian urban uh, structures and some modernist structures. Uh, I think we decided for this site because we didn't have any idea what to do there. I think this was a good condition to start with. So this is how we, we felt about the situation. It's a kind of neglected green area and it's dominated by, by traffic. This is not a spot where you would meet in the in the late 80s. It was just a transitional space for, for traffic. Like you can see here, it really was an open. And uh, as we didn't have any idea what to do, and I think we were not up to doing a building, we thought maybe it's interesting to look back how it, how it looked kind of uh, years before. We found uh, one of these nice postcards, and uh, we couldn't imagine how it looked before the World War II. And I think it's quite funny because this is, or this was then, and I think it's still now the concept for the official planning strategies in Berlin to make Berlin look like uh, we can see here, uh, which is kind of nice, but it's gone. But this is not a, a point where, where we could refer to. So we found some different conditions. This is after the war. Here you can see the, the Moritzbad where most of the structures had been gone by, by bombing and afterwards by um, taking away the, the destroyed buildings. And um, to look at this condition kind of neutral, it has some landscape aspects and you see the, the path going through the open space. I thought, uh, or we thought it could be an interesting uh, condition to, to reanimate. And the other was that, um, this part here again, more starts. It was really influenced by being close to the wall. So, I mean, Berlin wasn't only destroyed uh, in World War II, it was divided for a long time. I think these are aspects which officials really ignore to some extent in the concept they followed through. And another thing is, uh, which wasn't realized, but I think it had a huge impact. I found this old. Um, city map and it shows, we well, see the dotted lines here, these were the official plans for a new motorway through Berlin and I can find the more plots here. So I think on the, on the planning uh, in terms of uh, sites which were already um, fixed for the motorway, 
it, it has an impact on the on the West Berlin development, and even on for our side, and not only for our side because this development was actually uh, had a huge impact on the later developments in the 80s because of this people started to squat houses and uh, it, it changed the whole idea of, of uh, the city. So. Uh, so this was actually the condition we, we wanted to talk about because we said the, the Mordsblatt is not only the area in between these uh, subway entrances, but it's all the space between the houses we, we, we find. And we developed really straightforward three uh, scenarios for how, how to use the public space, which was first we said, well, we want to create a field which offers a lot of um, possibilities of appropriation and things you can do. Today, you would say it's a, a mixed space for traffic <coughs> people. Uh, I don't know if that term was there already in the late, late 90s. So we made the sketches like you can have sport fields at the same time the traffic is going around. Maybe it's a bit naive, but uh, it was a straightforward idea. And uh, we have can cinema presentations and kids do skateboarding. And uh, uh, even for cars, he thought it's nice to have a, a drive-in cinema sometimes, or markets, because it's close to um, Kreuzberg, which has a great Turkish community. Uh, the second scenario was to really create a specific atmosphere that you can feel and experience. So we said, well, it could be a, a wood. So you just transit in, on your way to Kreuzberg a different uh, atmosphere. And to make it more strong, we added this kind of tree houses where you well, imagine you could live there. So and this was like in the same style of, of drawings. We illustrated the atmosphere of the wood, so it should have been a, a real green roof hiding the, the whole space. And uh, to keep following the landscape concepts, we thought, well, a hill would be nice to have in between all these houses, with kind of alpine meadows spreading around and a small hut on top, and the tunnel for the cars, so it was kind of modernist thing to, to divide traffic from the surface people could use. And uh, we thought it could be great to exit the uh, U-Bahn and come to this kind of uh, alpine landscape. And uh, as well, uh, <coughs> we thought it could be nice if the, the, the the mountain or the hill could be kind of hollow and uh, uh, different programs within the mountain. And I think the whole program was a comment to the official <laughs> concept of how to develop the city because like, oops, sorry, I need to go back. Like here we did attach to the existing building a climbing mountain because Berlin was really in this uh, defined height of doing architecture with stony facades, so I think it could be nice to have a stony facade for climbing only, which could be part of the mountain. And so so uh, this is how it looks now, not, not much different in the aerial view. We are here. What has changed a lot, there's a new building here, and uh, there's a community garden here. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's, on one hand, it's a surprise what happened the last 15, 20 years, and the other had not because there's a lot of pressure on the on the market in Kreuzberg, so that people need to move there and uh, activate the space here. So this is the community garden, which is kind of famous. It's called Princessin Garden, and it's a really successful thing for people to meet, do gardening, and uh, share activities. And it's public. I mean, everybody can come for uh, getting the potatoes off out of the earth at, at a specific day in, in autumn, and it's, it's nice. And all the kind of industrial buildings are used now by, by the greatest scene artists or architects and so on. And uh, so, I mean, it's not that different in terms of, of uh, what has been done in terms of building. The only thing is this house really close to the uh, Moritzplatz itself at the roundabout, which is a real big department store for, for architects. You can buy the graphic material. Um, uh, but I think it's good because actually they started off during a student strike in the late 80s and they have become really big. And, and I think in the, it's a publishing house at the same, same time. And I think right now it's a place where you can go. Well, like Andreas yesterday said, well, if you say, well, let's meet the Moritzplatz, people say, yeah, why not? 20 years ago, nobody would have 
had the idea to meet at Moritz, but it was out of range completely. So, second. Uh, it's about um, a project, or several projects we did about the uh, Palace de République, which is the, was the former government uh, of the GDR. Here you have two conditions. The upper shows the, the, the castle that was there up to World War II and uh, was uh, demolished by the socialists to, to make a sign. And then they erected at the same spot the uh, was it? Palace de République, Palace of the Republic, which was not only the Parliament, but the Parliament was in there, but they had bars and bowling, uh, how's it bowling? Bowling for people, and it was open space for, for everybody. It was actually, I think it was a great idea. And of course, you could discuss about uh, the architecture, if it's nice or not, but it was a uh, part of the their development of the inner city with a fancied home that you maybe know here we have the palace of the republic and the green space here and the, the front office which was kind of torn down in the <coughs> early 90s from one day to another nobody knew and uh, I think the problem was or they or the officials have all the problem with the kind of GDR architecture they don't like for for political reasons for aesthetical reasons and I think uh, uh, maybe as well for historical reasons, they only want to refer to the time before World War II. I think always Nazi architecture is all right. It goes through because it's kind of stony and uh, respects the, the city fabric, uh, but not this kind of uh, shitty modernist architecture. So there was a big discussion and I agree the space is not really attractive in the city center. But there were big discussions going because there's one initiative, they tried to re-establish the castle. And the other one that said, well, maybe it's too fast, maybe we have to think about uh, this building before, and maybe it's, um, that there are kind of programs which make it attractive, and you can add something in front of the, this building. And uh, part of the discussion was a public call where we have been asked to, to make a suggestion. And we did a kind of analysis of all the proposals that have been made up to then. So we just did the distinction between, it's called new form, castle form, palace form, hybrid form, and empty space or void. And then you can find all the things that have been suggested by all different architects, mostly from Berlin. And this was actually our um, days to work on because uh, this is what people actually what was the most wanted uh, scheme the old castle but nobody had any idea what's inside so they just want the castle but we have don't we don't have any any rails anymore and um, so actually we use this castle so our idea was just to to fill the void uh, in between uh, with a mountain <laughs> <laughs> again, because I think uh, we thought if there's a void in the middle, uh, you have to fill it and we just make these quite, it was really straightforward uh, design, this uh, sculpture, and I think it looked really nice and uh, you could imagine be this being an architect, uh, be this, this being architecture, also it wasn't meant uh, at that moment as being a house, it just meant as a solid thing, just being, uh, filling the, the emptiness in the middle of the castle. At the same time, we've been asked uh, to to do a spatial concept for uh, a program is called uh, Volkspalast, which means People's Palace, which took place already the year before in the Palace of the Republic. And um, we were so much in the discussion for the call of, for ideas that we stayed at the mountain and said, well, this could be really nice. Testing the idea uh, and developing a mountain covering parts of the Palace of the Republic, being on the inside, on the outside, and uh, being a kind of framework for, uh, for, for the festival structure with, which presented different bands, theater performances, artist installation. So we developed three paths going through the building on, on the inside, which was, one was the pilgrim's path, one was the mountaineer's path, and the third was the philosopher's path. So and, and these were kind of guided tours through the building, 
because at that moment the building was not a building in terms of usability, so he had to apply to get the permission to to uh, make a temporary use, which is really difficult, because in terms of the meaning of the building, on one side, and on the other side, of in terms of uh, security and liability. So we actually got the permission on the evening when the opening already took place, so it was just in time. What you can see here as well is here um, it was a camp for people working on site because we invited a lot of friends or artists from all, all over Europe to, to work on this, on this great project, not only on the mountain, but to develop their own projects within the, the given structure. And they stayed here and they uh, slept in the camp. Uh, and the funny thing is, uh, I mean, here you can see the top of the mountain. The funny thing is, in some uh, Italian tourist guide, this must have been a kind of secret tip for parking your uh, mobile home because it all the time found these mobile uh, campers and were only coming from Italy. That's so fun. So, and this is this is an image I found in uh, the major uh, yellow press. Magazine, uh, the Bild Zeitung in Berlin, it shows me and, uh, and Wolfgang doing the top. It's pretty funny because it's kind of surreal because the, the top of the Fernsehturm is not that close. But, uh, so uh, if it's published in the Bild Zeitung, it has some meaning for, for the uh, public um, reading of the project. So this was the mountain we did on the inside. Here you can see a big bridge going through the, this, which, this was the, the main, main performance area when it was still in use. And here you can see it, it was part of an installation saying, uh, this is not a mountain, referring to Magrit. And here you can see uh, parts of the path going through the building, camp again, and uh, actually, the camp was quite nice, and the people uh, that stayed and worked there, it was always a nice atmosphere, open to talk. This was the breakfast, and we also offered uh, a lake, a mountain lake at the bottom of the mountain, where people could cool down, because it was pretty hot. And uh, this is a side project, actually, uh, that we developed, uh, that Romlogo developed for the time, for the festival. It was a um, kind of small hotel called uh, uh, Castle of Mountain Crystal. Uh, officially, it was the uh, backstage area for the artists because, I mean, you can't run a hotel without an application, but uh, you always have to find strategies where you can bypass uh, the official law. So we said it's a backstage, and we developed the hotel with, I think, four or five here. You can see different specific spaces, I think one, two, three, four, and the hotel was developed with students and it was run by students for the whole time and it was booked out for the whole time. So it was a secret tip. So here you can see how we developed the spaces within a, a scaffolding structure and uh, yeah. this was a space open to the Schlossplatz, we had nice views. Here again a collage of the different Places like uh, atmospheric images of the different. They were really specific, and you had light from the top or you to the outside. And afterwards, they started to demolish the Palace of the Republic. So, this shows the process. This shows another thing and another phenomenon of Berlin, like this building here. It's only. They, they, they did the corner. I mean, it's a nice building. It's a, it's a Schinkel building called Bauakademie. And they wanted to redo it, but they only did in a corner in stone, and the rest they made in kind of scaffolding structure. And they do that very often. I think it would be a nice strategy to follow through, doing the castle, whatever they want, and you can take it away very easily. I think it's good for testing. Um, the next thing that happened, yeah, you can see, it was a long process of taking down because all the materials have been recycled. They sold the steel and. Uh, Places. Then there was a competition of, uh, for interim use um, of the space. This is exactly where the palace uh, used to be. Uh, it was a temporary green area, mostly used by tourists. 
Um, I, I, I think I, I like the condition not for myself as a citizen of Berlin, but I like uh, the open condition, there's no palace and no castle, and now there would be the time to, to think of what to do. And we can really, don't have to fight black and white, so it would be time. But this is what's going to happen. This is the castle, and they started to build it. And I think it's going to be finished in, how do you know, 10 years, 20 years? 10 years. 10 years. So if you come to Berlin, Visit the castle, and they still, well, they have they developed a program. Program it's called the Humboldt Forum, which contains a museum, and they take all the museums from other parts of Berlin, which are quite nice, and they, they work to to fill the void of this uh, nice building. So I give to Andreas it's another project in Berlin Kreuzberg. Yeah, the next project I'm talking about is. Um Markthalle 9, which means Market Hall 9. Um, it is a historic market hall uh, located in Kreuzberg. And we started this project like three years ago, 2000, or actually four years ago, 2009. And there was a big discussion again um, what to do with this market hall, because this market hall was a former very important economic and social center of this Kreuzberg area. Maybe if you have been to Berlin, you know Görlitzer Park, it is here, and the Spree River over there, Warsaw Bridge. So it is some kind of very um, central located. And the interesting thing is that the market halls in Berlin were like all of the same time, like end of the 19th century. It was like 14 market halls that were built almost in the same years. Um, you can see them here in red. Here is the market hall number nine. And I think there are just left over four of them. And most of them are used like supermarkets or very not like a market hall anymore. And this was also the plan of the city of Berlin. This is an image as it was like it was used completely as a market hall. And the plan was to, to sell it to like best price um, to a supermarket chain and turn it into a regular supermarket. And yeah, here you can see some other pictures of the old structure. So you see the, this very small scale, like very many retailers that are all different. And this was actually the um, statues we found it. It's really close to to the Raumlaber office as well, but it, it ha hasn't been this center character anymore, like three years ago. And you, as you can see, there are like um, chains of discounters, dross bar, then there are two others, like very cheap um, supermarkets inside, like in this, just these boxes that are not connected in any uh, thing to the nice historic hall. And yeah, the, the, the decline of the market hall began actually in the in the 80s when all these small-scale retailers had to close. And as the, the, some residents beca uh, knew about these plans that the uh, that the city of Berlin is going to sell the market hall, they started an initiative to um, what can we else do with this market hall? And they were able to organize that there is one quarter of the hall. It, is, it was empty at that time and that they can use it for interim use. And they brought in like a temporary um, urban garden. It's actually the same we saw in the Moritzplatz project before. It was like the temporary um, quarter of them. And reintroduced like, the, like a kitchen that was in there. So there, it became somehow a new, get a new atmosphere and took also some other people that were not connected to this market hall anymore. And after this success somehow of this initiative of the residents, the Senate of Berlin decided, okay, maybe there is another way not to sell it for best price, but maybe for like the best concept. And then there was a competition 
and one of I think 19 teams was um, Florian, Bernd, and Nikolaus, and they came to Raumlabor and asked us, "Okay, are you interested in working with us for an idea of a contemporary market hall in Berlin, very close to your office in Kreuzberg, and so on?" So, quite interesting thing, and this were is how we somehow started, like to, to think not about the architecture itself, but about um, what is the market hall. What is like, it's not just about selling products, it's, it's much more. To us it is like a social space, it's like it can become like part of an, a public space. It's also always a kind of structure that is open for new ideas or gives new, um, new openness to, to, to other cultures. And so we started to think about, okay, what, what does this um, old market hall have? What, what do we want to, to uh, reintroduce or what do we want to do to change? And yeah, there are different aspects. And we try to um, bring them all in one drawing, like to, to have like an indoor. The interesting thing is that it's connecting like two streets, it's like in an inner block situation. So you can walk through and you have a, like a connecting of these two public streets. So it has the potential to become somehow um, part of the public space. Um, then we were thinking about this corners where you have maybe a second story and like a somehow like a center where you have not just um, retailers but other more social um, usage usage and. <coughs> This was what came out as for the competition as a ground floor plan. Like we we reintroduced or reinterpreted this small scale structure, added some new um, um, main buildings. We always were talking like it is somehow like a like a village with like the um, um, the church, the city hall, and the theater, and. Um, also, for us, it was clear that it's not possible to close the market hall in, from one day to the other, or to close the store that are in the market hall from one day to the other. But it is also some experimentation phase, and you need you need some time to develop it, like in this small scaled um, structure. So there were we developed like four phases where that was connected with the space, like quarter space, half the market hall. Like three quarter, the whole market hall, and I just just wanted. I think this plan was due to the financial potent, potential. The, the the three our partners had, they couldn't afford to close down the market hall at once and do all the things new. This was one aspect. The other aspect was there were three running contracts with the, the discount markets. Which I mean, if you want to get them out, you have to pay them out, which uh, would have been another uh, financial problem for them. So we just thought maybe we make the disadvantage to an advantage to suggest a really s slow development where we can always start slowly and uh, try things, what works or doesn't work. Because I think uh, the, the most interesting thing is what I found out so far is how does the contemporary market works? Because uh, when we did the competition, I, I, I thought, well, a market is a market, and uh, people go there to buy their uh, uh, everyday to buy for their everyday needs. But it, it's not like that. People go there for a special experience in, in, in shopping. I think this is what I experienced so far. But I think this is what you need. You need the time to experience this, and then you can make the right decisions. And so, I just want to at disadvantage, advantage. <laughs> and they also were thinking like not just to have like these resellers, but also add other programs that is becoming even not the, the supermarket with different kind of food, but also like a, the center of the, of the neighborhood again. And what we were thinking about, okay, we, what kind of structure do we need for this small scale market that is like somehow open to all these ideas that are coming from outside and what kind of structure can we offer? And what we found was like this um, from Stephen Hall, Manila housing project from the, I think from the 70s or end of the 70s, um, where just a very simple steel structure is given 
it's like a was a, like a concept for how to deal with favela housing or like this uh, informal housing structures. So how can you give them a somehow a structure? And we somehow um, took that idea over and said, okay, maybe it is just enough for the beginning to have like this very simple steel structures. And maybe the, the resellers start with a few boxes with their food in, and then they start to, I hope you can see this picture, a bit and bright. We always understood this as an urban development. So the city within a city. Yeah, so we it want is. to do an urban fabric which provides a, a slow and individual growth. So, so you can uh, grow step by step, and it is not like, okay, I have to buy this kind of size of a store. And then we also develop like designs for um, this, we call them the three guys, like this additional social interaction um, buildings in the middle. Like to us, it was very important also to have like a kitchen or something that is given this food in a different way or also uh, has the possibility to give lessons in how to deal with food and like a kiosk or food court situation and like a bakery and maybe also a second level where you have like an overview over this like city and yeah these are two pictures how we were introducing this idea in the competition and I think this picture shows very good this idea that Christoph uh, said, like the, the idea of the city within a city. So the market is somehow not just like a supermarket with products that you can buy, but it is very um, dispersed and very, um, you have like a great public space somehow in between. And but we also, oh wow, this is, this is moving. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that it is a film. Um, we introduced um, before the competition was ended, like a workshop with students from Dortmund and also from Prague, and asked them, okay, what kind of market stall ideas do you have? How can you um, go on with this idea as a contemporary market? And they built like in a, one week, did some designs and started to build it and then we had with the in initiative of the residents and also with our Market Hall 9 team like a presentation inside the hall. It was very in a some playful character but I, I think it was good to, to get into this um, kind of conversation also with the public and to start like this developing process even before the competition was decided. And finally, the team of Mark Talit 9, with, together with us, won the competition. And uh, half a year later, there was the big reopening of the market um, at just one quarter of the hall and just with like temporary market stalls for the beginning. Um, but it, if you uh, reimagine the, the pictures from the beginning with the empty hall, it reintroduced somehow very strong this idea of this small scale market. And I think from this day on, it, it, it took like a completely different um, uh, kind of people to the market hall again. So it was somehow again becoming like the center of this um, neighborhood. And yeah, this was. Mm, one year later, when we maybe remember the, the ugly kitchen from the beginning, we um, said, okay, we have to to rethink maybe a bit the idea of our three guys. We, we go on with the structure that is already there and we redevelop the kitchen and give it a new design and also a new, um, like, that you really can use it as a kitchen for, for having lunch there, for example. This is um, Seth and Christian, two guys that we are working very often with, um, and they built together with our planning this nice new kitchen with like a cafe area in the front, and then you have like here the kitchen in the back, and like open the possibility to open it up to the market hall. And the, the interesting thing is, 
these windows. We, are the, we found them at the office. Uh, Raumlabor is located in the Karl Marx Allee. It's a former eastern, it's a eastern part of Berlin. And these are the um, these are buildings that are very strong connected to this uh, GDR um, social, not social housing, but um, socialist. socialist housing. And these were like for us the, the modules we we built this um, kitchen. And they offer us also this like flexibility and also the this kind of openness that we were wanted to introduce in the market hall and I think it's also working quite good together with the existing yeah, structure. Another issue is I, I think we wanted always to recycle materials and we use recycling materials and it was just a um, perfect situation that we found uh, containers of these windows in front of our office and uh, I, it was difficult to, to figure it out how it could work as a kitchen but in the end I think it was quite good and we had a lot of discussions with uh, with our clients and with the authorities for, for uh, uh, hygiene, or how do you say? Hygiene, hygiene aspects and so on. But uh, I think in, in the atmosphere, as it fits quite the market town. I think it fits the concept of reusing materials, what they really want to, to go through with all the stalls. Yeah, this is a. Um, politician of the Green Party in Berlin with a public event connected with the kitchen. So at the moment it is run uh, by a great cook, you see him here from the back, and he is offering lunch every day and this is like one of the first programs that is like in this daily rhythm and it gives like a completely new attitude to the, to the hall because people are coming there meeting for lunch and so it became somehow this, this meeting point again connected to the um, idea of a good food. Um, this was uh, also last year, it was a group of young people uh, organized in a youth club and they were um, uh, part of a program called Ladenhüter, what is um, that young people that have some empty spaces can develop their own concepts for um, to use them or to, to, to develop their somehow own business. And they were connected also to the market hall and wanted to introduce somehow like a small store or like small V uh, small structure, like an additional free element in the market hall. And we did some workshops, some design workshops with them and actually what came out was a bit in the way we also were thinking for this bakery, like to have some steps where you can have this like second area where you can sit on, where you have possibility to have a store to the other side. So somehow a module where you have different possibilities to use in the hall. And it was for us somehow also the, like a prototype for, okay, how can this um, market hall structure, like this simple steel structure, how can this look like, how can we, what can we do with it, how can we also transform it uh, with different parts. And then we build it together with the young people and it's, this is a scene when um, it is finished and people use it as like sitting benches and sit on top. And um, I think this is a scene when there's a food market now every Thursday. What is running quite good. I think there are some pictures afterwards. And yeah, now it is starting to become, um, there are still a lot of these temporary market stalls, but it's starting to have some uh, important fixed stalls, like there, for example, this one or there is a bakery now in the middle where you have like this possibility to watch how, how do they make the bread. There's a lot going events on with um, <coughs> always dealing with this kind of um, cooking, self-cooking. And this is the um, what is very popular on Thursdays now that they make a, like an open street market 
where all the resellers that are in the market hall cook their food and the whole evening is like a very nice atmosphere full of people and you can try very different foods from all over the world. And I think this is really very close to this first ideas that we have in the competition and we are, yeah, this, this picture like very much shows this idea of the market hall also with this great light on, through the roof. Yeah, I think it's on a good way somehow. Okay, uh, now we go to a bigger um, project. It's about um, the airport of Tempelhof, which you maybe know. We call it Grading Frameworks. Uh, it's about a study we, we have been commissioned by the Senate of Berlin. Before I go into the project, I want to uh, explain the historic situation. This used to be before there was a, an airport in the, in the area, so it was always an open green area which was used by military at the one hand, but it was open to people to go there for a picnic. Later, uh, it was, there was the first airport uh, with, the, with the Zeppelin, that you can see here, this is the first airport. And I think this is a funny, uh, funny uh, situation because there's one airport here and they just did the new one, the, the, the Nazi one, and they were at, this, at, at the same spot at the same time. So I think this was still running and this was under construction. And I think the airport is really famous for the um, airlift, which was in the 50s when Western Berlin was closed uh, from the rest of Germany and the United States made, made the airlift to provide uh, Western Berlin with all the food and, and things that, that was needed. So it, it's, it's a real emotional thing, which a lot of people rely or refer to, to this building. And this, uh, it, it was used by the Americans, I think, by the by mili uh, military, America, uh, by the U.S. Air Force, up to the I think mid mid of 80s. Then it was opened up as a public airport for how you say proper <laughs> transport or whatever. And you see how it took that, that time. And uh, at some point, uh, the, there was a decision to close two of the Berlin airports to make a new one, a bigger one, outside because while well, it's not up to date to have an airport in, in the inner city, which is maybe right. Uh, but then there was an um, initiative um, by people who didn't want to close the airport down and they tried to stop this. And I think this was about the time when, when we came in, when we were asked to develop ideas for a uh, for an after use after closing down because I think it was we started 2000, 2007 and uh, I think that time there was still a crisis on the market there was no pressure though no um, development on the um, um, building sector so they were kind of desperate because they had to to argue that they need to close the airport but they had to offer something to, to the people, especially the politicians. They always need to, to make explanations and to, to refer, especially in a situation when some of the people want to prohibit the, the closing down. So, and you have to imagine this is really a huge area uh, in, in, in square meters, 3,820,000, and the building, which is one of the biggest in the world, I think you can see it from the moon. I haven't checked that, but I heard about that, which is about 300,000 square meters. So, what to do with this area? Uh, this is a collection of ideas that have been talked in newspapers, brought from people, what could there happen. Well, you see, a lot of things can be happened. It's big enough to have the biggest, tallest building of Berlin, you have a fun you have a smart, you have a leg, everything. Uh, but uh, you, you can tell that there was really no concept of how to use this area. And actually we thought it's... Um, it's a chance. The problem they have is a chance for us because here you see the last plane leaving the airport. Here you have on the right hand side the master plan which was there already. And they, had, we, had, they had developed this plan from, for more than 10 years. But uh, the situation we came in, there was this so-called time gap because they didn't know how to use, how to fill a time gap. And we thought it's a great opportunity to uh, 
define new strategies in urban planning. This is a principle or strategy of the Venetian Bridge. I think it's really great. It's diagrammed by a Dutch architect whom we met in one of the um, conferences we did. So it's uh, about a dynamic process which is open to a certain amount of time which you can define. We said five years would be great to to go there, stimulate ideas, find programs which has a really big amount of openness and after after five years you have to to start to to find out or you have to start to, to define programs because then you know what works or doesn't work. And uh, this was I think the initial concept to, to develop a dynamic plan. This is one of the workshops with a really huge model, this was one to five hundred where you can see all the people could walk on and test scenarios and discuss uh, and uh, this was one of the first diagrams. We, we said it's not about mm, not about the urban design itself. It's more about designing a process. And I think very important for us was to to link like uh, short-term developments with long-term perspectives because master plan master plan always has a long-term perspective, and then they don't care what what's happening now because they are only think in the finish in their finished vision. And um, it's, it reminds a little to the market hall diagram. It happened almost the same time. And I think it's the same idea behind the strategy. So starting with kind of informal settlements and uh, the program becomes more and more dense and you have kind of stepping stones of interim aims. And, uh, uh, and we, th we thought it's important to do a kind of monitoring on this process by, by, by the officials and they can find out. What, what's good and what's not good. I think mm, the administration is always afraid that it's a kind of uncontrolled process, but this is not what we're up to. I think uh, what, what it needs is a strong, maybe, curatorship, or a strong panel of people who, who are in charge and can make the right decisions. And we call the whole um, process um, dynamic or organic master plan, so it's always... Uh, uh, there is a kind of... that we, we didn't question the master plan itself, we, thought, we only said how to establish it we, we need to fit to, to different tools and uh, it's not that we make a kind of uh, interim use uh, for five years and then the big boys come and they all had to go so we, we wanted to link these kind of actions that's why we think it's always important to have a feedback from what's going or what's going on on, on the field to the master plan and, and update the information in, in the planning so this is what this diagram shows and uh, the headline is develop new tools because we are convinced that the normal tools they are not sufficient to do developments like this in a time like like, like we have now. And um, to make it suitable for the communi communication to the from the administration to the politicians, we put it on on a ten step plan for activation mm -hmm. because it's always easy to understand ten steps to to to, to the goal. And uh, I don't want to go too much into detail of any of the steps, but uh, two of them are, uh, are coming up. It's, or maybe I go through short, it's great organizational structures because we thought it's important for people who want to do develop things there. They don't have to go to five or six different spots within Berlin. It's just one-stop office where they find everything, where they can find everything they need and answer their questions. Uh, second, build partnerships uh, with like institutions like universities, uh, with the mass media, uh, with local initiatives, with, with the art scene, because you need multiplicators of people to come there and uh, st starting to, to, to test things. Then three, of course, open defense, which is actually uh, quite plausible, but uh, you have to communicate this. And for, uh, we always said after a, a time for more than 40, 50 years that this area has been closed, we need to, to define a time for an exploration program where people can, it, was, it, it should be before the, the area has been open completely, but it's a time when people can come, maybe have guided tours, maybe specific programs so that they can 
uh, discover a new area of Berlin, rely themselves to, to, to specific, specific spots, and I think it shortens down the time to the reopening, because I think this is important, you can't close an airport and then uh, let people wait for several years. So uh, five is start fields for urban pioneers, I'm going more into here with this, uh, make open calls to, to get multiple ideas, build a ring which was more kind of infrastructural uh, idea to uh, to allow different uses, uh, sportive uses in there. Then great special places within the huge area for people to go. Maybe they could be temporary, like for example the um, Serpentine Pavilion in London, which is a kind of artistic approach to it. Uh, then bundle activities was an idea for a festival, <coughs> like a Biennale called the Temporale. We didn't have the content, but uh, we thought it could be nice to make a festival, maybe for, for pioneer years. And uh, what I explained before, link activation to long-term processes. So um, this was the plan for the pioneer years. We always say maybe it was the most ugly plan we uh, needed to draw, but it was, uh, uh, at the same time, it was kind of successful. There was a long discussion, and if you work for the administration, uh, I think you need to compromise your ideas down to, to a specific level <laughs> till it starts hurting, <laughs> maybe. But um, to bring your idea through, and so we defined these different areas where we thought it would be nice to have pioneer uses. Actually, we would have liked them also in islands within the field, but this wasn't allowed. And then we we try to convince them that there should be different paths of development. I mean, the path going from here up there, which is the most common path. So pioneer or intermediate users come and go. But we think it could be more interesting to, to make them become part of the urban development. So like uh, the pioneer use, I don't know if you can see it from, from there, become um, part of the urban structure, and maybe they become the center of a new neighborhood. Or some of them could be really uh, successful, and they start themselves being a kind of uh, developer, which happened been already. So we, we, we thought it, it must be, needs to be more open to different paths of development. Uh, this was the, uh, the plan for the time of uh, exploring the, the field, and this unfor unfortunately didn't happen. They closed down the, the area, because I think this would have been a really good goal for, for people to, to come and uh, experience the field. Let's skip this. Because what then happened was um, they closed down the airport in 2008, autumn, that was the last flight, and then um, it was opened up in May 2000. So for almost two years it was closed, and I mean, there were arguments that make, made it plausible because part of the area was uh, was processed by the um, country of Germany, by the state of Germany, and some of the area was uh, owned by by Berlin, and they had to make a deal, and uh, and so on. And there are always kind of uh, arguments about safety and security. But I think the strategy we uh, suggested to make these temporary weekend openings would have. I think it worked well. What then happened uh, was an initiative called Heavy Aero Squad at an airport. And uh, there was one week and there were really a lot of people tried to, to get over the fence and, and spot the airport. And uh, this was, uh, the, the airport was defended by the police. And we found out that the, the operation, the police operation, was about 950,000 euros. And then you start questioning wouldn't, have, wouldn't it have been better to spend the money otherwise instead of prohibiting people to get to the airport? As if, as, as, uh, to, uh, instead, oh, uh, sorry, it would have been better to open it up and spend the money in, in kind of pioneer use uh, installation or whatever. And then I think you start with the opening then? Yeah. So finally there was the big opening of the whole field in May 2010. And yeah, the city council somehow organized a bit like party, but it was just like a lot of beer tents and nothing more, not so much program. But actually, as you can see, it was very popular to, to use the field, to explore the field. 
And what was interesting that people very fast found out about like there is a very good wind because the situation is a bit like higher than the rest of the city. And they started to have this like surfing and uh, kite, kite skating and so on. So it became from almost one day to another a very different place and very, very lively place. And especially for this, you see in the back, it's Neukölln, it's a very dense housing area. And to them, they lived like very long, very close to this airport. And they had now a nice park and like this big field in front of them. So it somehow opened up very much to the, to the city in this direction. Yeah, here you can see the, the old building and like the, the new use, like barbecue. And so at the beginning, the people were just trying a lot of things out. And actually, what was a nice thing that there was not so much change. The only thing is that they had a fence like that is disconnecting the building from the park. But the rest of the park was very rough somehow. They, they kept. Um, almost all of the, the airport facilities. It just fenced like the maybe dangerous parts. But there was no um, like park design or something like that this time. And yeah, somehow coming back to this like uh, exploration phase we um, suggested in the competition for the field. And what we um, started at the very beginning was like, I want to show two projects. One is the knot. The knot is like, there's also a big movie in our exhibition where you can go more deeply into it. Um, but just to, to tell you what it's about, it's like a mobile um, structure that is like bringing um, artists and cultural activity to different places. Um, it was active in Berlin, in Warsaw, and in Bucharest, and like one of the first um, places it, it took place was at the Temple of Airfield, and I think it, it worked quite very well at this place, because it was like one of the first activities or the first programs that took place at this big field, and it had also like this kind of openness of program and space that was um, coming together very good with the with the wide wideness of the field. Yeah, you can see like the also city mattress. Like it was somehow um, working quite good. Um, and another, the next project that took place last year, it was the Great World Fair, the, the Große Weltausstellung. Um, it is a project we Omnibor did together with um, the Hau Theater, it's an independent theater in Berlin. And the idea was somehow to, to have a comment, like a critical comment on this idea of a world fair. So the, the thing was not to to organize some, some um, branding of, of nations, but to introduce some political or subjective artistic statements on also the temple of field, but also like in a world politic um, um, uh, thing. And it was an exhibition parkour um, out of 15 pavilions. Even every pavilion curated by one artist. And yeah, it was somehow, it wanted to start like a discussion about uh, how to deal with, um, this, this, how sensibly managing resu resources. And yeah, I just show some impressions of the, of the festival. Here you can see the festival pavilion, people hanging around. There was a bar with music and here, the pavilion. So it was also important to us to, to, to have again like this openness or that people want to, to start exploring what's going on. And we, for example, this pavilion, you can see here, it was curated by Eric Gönnerich and it was um, like dealing with the history of the world fairs in general and giving to every, to the different topics. You see here this protest posters 
given the critic comment on all these topics that former world fairs had. And I think what was also an interesting thing is that um, like a third of the of the pavilions were actually former uh, airport buildings that we transformed into like this new kind of pavilion, so they were already there. And we just added some new parts to make them to become this pavilion. And we also used uh, almost for half of the structures uh, recycled materials from other exhibitions. So i just show you to give some examples. It's um, from Tokishi Okada, he dealt with the topic of the Fukushima um, power plant and introduced with his theater group like a piece that was dealing with the topic of nuclear energy and how to find different ways of dealing with them. Uh, Tracy Rose, who introduced um, an uh, old Blaupunkt television it was like for her, he, he, she grew up in South Africa and it was like the only connection to the, to the Western world to her for a long time. And it was a, like a soap opera in black and white, like performed by real actors, like for the whole um, duration of the festival. Um, this pavilion is by Gabi Mrue, I hope I spell it correctly. And it was like a built a uh, YouTube video actually of the Syrian, still ongoing Syrian revolution. Um, this was uh, Delbrücke and De Mol, and a pretty interesting suggestion for to have like a mobile housing or like small scale housing for older artists that are coming to Berlin because in Berlin there are a lot of artists coming at the moment and they were thinking about okay what's happening when they are all getting older and maybe you don't have so much money so we have we need something maybe like a like a zoo or something for them. And they also deal with like this model inside. And this is Ant Company and the World Freud Center. They built like this pavilion, like used as a stage, but also exhibition. It was very small scale thing where you can explore a lot. Maybe and one, one thing to add, because the pavilions were developed from one artist with our Labo. So we made the design together with the artist, and uh, I think it was built by a huge team of interns we had at the time and students. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a pavilion um, giving a sound installation uh, of camels in Egypt. I, I, I don't exactly know what it's about, to be honest. Um, yeah, and again, the bar, like it was a bit um, by Umschichten, it's a group of architects from Stuttgart. You have to speed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Next, uh, coming back to this pioneer fields, Christoph already introduced, just to give an uh, impression how it is developed since then. Like the um, Senate of Berlin took this idea over and yeah, redesigned it a bit in their way. So there was like a I'm not sure was it a competition with uh, no, ideas there was a, competition. There was a call for ideas. A call actually. for ideas. I mean, uh, sorry, Andres, but I just to to make to hurry up a little bit because uh, I didn't make it clear. My part of Temple of was theory. His part is what happened so far, <laughs> and uh, because he was talking about the uh, um, exploration phase as well, we we implemented the ideas, but it was after the official opening. So actually, we, we couldn't get through the phase we suggested, but we pushed the ideas, of course, later. So the projects that have been shown, like the NAT or the, the World Fair, the kind of cultural, cultural projects we brought to the Temple of Airfield. And now I think we can run through quite quickly to what's going on right now uh, in terms of pioneer use. There are really uh, some open gardens and uh, a lot of gardening projects, of course, which is kind of close that, that it happens there. But what I like is that they're open, they're not fenced, so everybody can go there and uh, work if, if he likes, but it's actually kind of private. And um, yeah, and it's, it's starting to, to give like the, this big field some like different zones with different characters. And 
yeah what, what I what I like very much is that there's like some activity and always there's still something going on people build some structures and there's also some sport fields temporary and what is now going on since a couple of months that are, the structures are becoming a bit more more formal maybe or also organized by different um, groups or different organizations but this is for example a pavilion of young architecture that are dealing with like ideas for future of Berlin or this is um, pavilion built out of um, this prefabricated plates of former um, Soviet buildings and it's also about to, to start a discourse about what's going on at Tempelhof and in, this, in, in Berlin in general. And just to end it, this is like, there was a, a landscape, um, landscape urbanism um, competition that is the winning team, the translation into the master plan, and this is actually what is now planned by the Senate, like to, to keep this big field in the middle and to have like housing and uh, also like the new uh, li big library for Berlin um, around. And yeah, what is now going on is like um, initiative of residents to not build anything on the field, to keep like 100% of the field. So they, um, they, they claim for, for the park now, and I think this is a result of the whole process, what was going on up to now, that people start, well, this is our park and we want to keep it like it is now, and then it's good. This was one point, and the other point, I think it's interesting that I was telling you about uh, interfering short-term aims with long-term uh, visions and the long-term missions they had one was the EGA International Garden Exhibition and one was the EBA and both are gone so they don't have actually actually no vision no more so I think it's a kind of interesting point and uh, another thing is that up to now I think it was it, it based on the trust people the pioneers trusted the Senate or the, the, the uh, agency that developed the area that, it, that they were together and I think it, it, came, it came to a point because some of uh, these initiatives are, are the pioneers that they fight. And it, it's, it's, I think the trust is gone at some extent. I think this is uh, it's interesting to, to, to follow through. Uh, actually, we have another project, but we can, we, can, we can quit this or we run through. I don't know if, you, if, you, if you're interested. It, it consists of two parts. One is a study we were commissioned. And another thing is a small building we did, which kind of closely refers, which is maybe more not that dry. Or we can stop it now if you want. I'm not worried. Maybe if you just want to quickly go through them and then we'll have some questions and discussions. So okay, yeah. so we speed up. Um, yeah, so I think I don't tell the big story. We also try to always have <laughs> a bit of Berlin context to get a better understanding, but it is actually about um, to offer cheap or low-cost um, at atelier space to, to Berlin artists and it's a bit why there are a lot of artists in Berlin and there was also a lot of free spaces because of Berlin was, was this island when the Berlin Wall was and after the wall was thrown down there was all these eastern parts where there were a lot of spaces that you could use for, for artistic for artist spaces or atelier spaces also for cheap housing and yeah, this is a Tacheles building, it's one of the most famous um, examples of this and now it's starting to, for example, this one is closed um, last year and it will be thrown down soon, I think. And so there's also the need for somehow new low-cost artist space in Berlin, but there are not enough um, buildings anymore that are that offer like the possibility to, to transform them into these spaces. So we were, um, we had this contract that we developed a study. How is it possible to um, to offer these low cost spaces to to artists in a new building? That we looked at some Berlin artist spaces, like we, we found out different topics: nomade, monument interface like how is it connected to the city is it just like an atelier house or is it also like a social interaction um, thing like the enclave like a small town within the city and then what we were what we found out is somehow that 
the artists always um, started to to transform the, the original idea of the building and this is like maybe you know the, this website IKEA hackers where they use um, the parts of an IKEA uh, furniture to turn into different things and this we somehow tr translated with um, building systems or like this industrial prefabricated <coughs> building systems for example housing container and then we always started to have like what is the system or how is the addition what is like what is it contained from and what is a possibly an upgrade I mean the, the idea garage. was as the budget was ridiculous low what we have been asked to do uh, we said we only can we can't design because the, maybe there's no specific studio which fits all needs on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, we, we said maybe it's much more sense using existing structures which are maybe too big or different from the, what, what artists use, but I think it makes sense in terms of the way artists usually adapt spaces or uh, discover spaces they, they use so far in existing buildings. Maybe it's a bit absurd doing a new building to, to, to yeah, offer con space, con offer space and have to adapt it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, we were thinking also about these principles, efficiency, sufficiency, it's just short now, but to offer more space, is it with a low, lower comfort or is it better to, to have like very small scale spaces and high comfort? Mm -hmm. And finally we developed like three prototypes, one is like a parking garage uh, atelier shelf. With like this, this ramp as a like interface to the public. I think this was one outcome of the when we had the research of the existing buildings that it's really important not only offer studio spaces for the artists, but having spaces for communication exchange, at least within the within the structure, for us more interesting in communication with the with the city or better with the neighborhood. So I, I think this was one idea we were up to when we developed the prototypes out of these prefab structures, and always implementing the, the zoning by temperature because. It's not doesn't make sense to give a cheap building if you have to pay a lot for heating later. So you <coughs> always have to, to negotiate the different needs. And I think good for us was that we did this project before. This is for a <coughs> friend of ours um, who is an artist and who asked us to do a um, um, studio space for him because he was sold out by a property developer and he wanted to invest the money himself. He came with a kind of really um, specific idea with the greenhouse, it was his idea because he saw it, um, maybe you know uh, the, the French architect La Cateau Vassal, they're kind of famous for, for doing uh, this kind of stuff and, and then he asked uh, us, or specifically me because he, he's a friend of mine, if I, I could do it. First it was kind of difficult because it was this so-called, uh, I, I saw, uh, said Duchamp uh, effect because when Duchamp put this pistol in the museum he had, he broke a taboo but he erected a taboo as well. So. I wasn't sure if I would like to do it the way he wants it, but it was nice. We met uh, Jean-Philippe Vassal, he was teaching in Berlin, and he's a really, really nice guy. He was open for discussion, and he was really excited about the idea, what he wanted to do. And I actually, I went through <coughs> quite quickly. It took a really long time to find a suitable uh, site or rooftop, which offered all the conditions we needed to do this. And then it was a long way to get all the permissions. This is the proof, we got them finally. We had a, I think we went there for almost half a year, weekly or uh, every two weeks, to, to convince the guy that, that it works and it's, that it's a roof. Because, I mean, we had a discussion if it's a roof or it's not a roof. <laughs> because uh, depending on the definition, you have the different uh, fire regulations. This was basically the concept so that the space which is offered uh, grows uh, with the seasons. So here, spring, you only have the cores, and the types in between have the whole interior space, and summer you have more because there's a terrace. So we had different layers, like, like an onion, like a, yeah. This is kind of interesting because this was this is a plan I, I, I offered uh, Christian and this was what uh, came up in the end because it, a lot of things uh, resided uh, on site. So and he at, at some point he felt that he needs more space because this was what we 
develop like a space in the middle that's open to the, the core spaces. And he found out he needs more space on top of it, which doesn't work that well, but he's happy with it. So. This was actually the only detail, because to keep the cost really low, we thought uh, detail is, is expensive, just let it go. But this was important because this is the spot where the new building meets the old one, and I thought it's a lot of responsibility we take. And it was driven by the budget, of course. So uh, Christian started to build uh, to, to buy windows uh, by eBay before we already had the spot, and uh, he sent me all, all the, the mails. I got another window. I got another window. <laughs> and that's him. He was really uh, in, in, into the building process, and sometimes he had really crazy ideas. Some sometimes he wrote me an email. I want to have this fireplace, and he did it, <laughs> and with some funny details like how the fireplace hits the door. But he's an artist, you can do it. And here you can see the building process. We always made fun, it looks like a garage on the rooftop. And this is the, you can see here the, the, the core, which are done with kind of bricks, and the uh, exterior, which is done with a kind of um, greenhouse structure from made of polycarbonate. And that's kind of some impressions about the interior and the users. And thank you.